Hey, I'm Marcus. And I'm Atrex. We are Working Class Nerds. Cue the intro. right we are working class nerds the podcast that gives you no information about your favorite information today is thursday june 16th 2022 and you can find this 156 podcast on apple podcast buzzsprout google podcast stitcher spotify and anywhere you can find a podcast in the galaxy far far away you can now find every single working class nerds episode on the youtube at marcus b814 you can also watch me completely dominate at video games Tuesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays at twitch.tv slash MarcusB814. And you can see me play video games Monday nights at twitch.tv slash A underscore Atrax. You can also find the both of us on Twitter, Marcus at MarcusB814, and I am Atrax underscore A. And this week's episode... We're talking about panels and cons with Dr. Gameology. Doc is a longtime friend of mine, as Jenny would say, one of my best friends. And he is journeying around the country talking about mental health and video games. Welcome back to the show. And what have you been up to? I've been up to that. Everything <laughs> you just said. <laughs> and I am actually right now giving a follow to at a tracks underscore a on twitter <laughs> all right we just met so that's a thing that we do to show that we don't think a person that we just met totally sucks although uh a tracks i have no way to verify if my assumption that you don't totally suck is uh true but um you have this episode to prove yourself <laughs> yes well, well he that's definitely a lot of doesn't pressure. suck it's not a lot of okay. pressure. You don't suck because he's the <laughs> he's the resident um, evil he, co-host. He's oh. the resident co-host when Nick is out playing paintball, as I'm saying right now. So, like I just said, Nick is in Philadelphia. Oh, excuse me, he's in Philadelphia playing a little bit of shoot 'em up paintball, and uh, yeah, he's not here. So, Doc, what have you been doing? I have been doing everything that you can possibly cram into a day. I decided to say yes to it. And so now I, I, I teach grad school, right? I teach mental health counseling to students and I provide counseling services and I have a website, drgameology.com, which just launched in May mm -hmm. and we have the podcast now going there every week everything's working fine on that side so we have some posts to go along with the episodes for people who want to look at pictures and read things while they listen and we also have i have the blog going on where i'm putting transcriptions of the mental health moments i've been doing for years and i've also been writing actual blog posts so they're posts that don't have a video to go with them and then I've been taking other things that are not videos and creating videos for them and putting those on the website too. The whole point of the website is to give me a one-stop resting place where everything I do about the psychology of video games can be found. And for people then to be able to bounce around and see all the things I do easily because you know Twitch is great, but it's just Twitch. And then YouTube is great, but it's just youtube and then all the social medias i've been doing those and they're all just so separated and i was joking with a friend today who did one of our recent episodes of the gaming persona podcast which i would love everyone listening to this to go subscribe there so that you can keep a a finger on the pulse of everything i'm doing with different topics 
but I was talking with her about how her Instagram posts are so good and mine are bad and it's Twitter's fault because I'll have a really good post going. And before I send it out to all the socials, I'll get this nice notification from Twitter that says you have too many characters. So then I have to start deleting things, but then I'm not maximizing what it should look like on Instagram. And then Instagram is sharing with Facebook and then there's LinkedIn too, because I have to be an expert on my topic in the eyes of academic people. Oh, oh, and my Final Fantasy XIV research study is getting presented in Poland in three weeks. Who's who's going to be um, presenting it? Me and... So my actual name is Dr. Daniel Kaufman. And so I'm the lead researcher on this project. And then I have a partner I brought in for the research and data analysis part. And that's Dr. Stephanie diaz Morel. And we are both games researchers uh, in different mental health fields. And so we work with people and we both have our practices that are all named gaming kinds of things. So my practice is area of effect counseling or AOE counseling because I started out as a healer and I wanted to keep everyone alive and have a positive impact on the battle arena around me. So it just felt like the perfect way for me to tell people, hey, you can work with me. I got you. And then for people who don't know what an AOE is, they'll just call me because they need a counselor. But, you know, for the people that know, it's an instant sign that this is going to work and it's going to be productive. It's going to work. Yeah. Um, you know, so everybody knows when Doc says that he crams as much into his day as possible, he's not kidding. Literally, he'll call me and he'll be like, look it, I wanted to talk to you. I haven't talked to you in a week, but I have 12 minutes until my next counseling appointment. So I'm going to talk <laughs> wow. for six and you talk for six and we'll get to touch base. And then when the minute comes, he'll go, Marcus, we've talked for 13 minutes. I've got to go. <laughs> Down to the minute. Wow. That's, no, that's that a true is, story, everyone. And to be honest, if if I get like a random time call from him, I know he's in the car because that's like the freest 20 minutes he has to chat. It's the <laughs> that's best. That's the only time I'm free. Yes. Yes, exactly. But that's, you know, sometimes I talk to eight tracks when I'm driving home sometimes, and that's like the most productive 20 minutes of my day. Oh, yeah. That doesn't involve cabinets and being a boss. Uh, well, I'm super pumped you're back. I can't wait to talk more about this stuff in a minute. But before I ask Atrax what he's been doing, I have a little uh, secret to tell everybody that's listening. So uh, a couple months ago, maybe, yeah, a couple months ago, maybe more than that. I don't even know how much time has gone by. I was kind of in a predicament. And when I was in a predicament, I said, you know, my content is stale. Like I love streaming, but I want more out of the content. I want more for the podcast. I want more. I want more for the whole nerds community, like the cohesiveness. And one day I was talking to Atrax and Atrax is a great video editor. And I asked him about it and he has other people that he works with. And I didn't never would want to take. The, him away from other people. And I said, Hey, you know, could you do me a favor and make a video for me? Just one. And he goes, yeah, sure. Why? And I was like, I just want to, I just want a video. I feel like one video is all I need. And he's like, okay, what do you want it to be? And I said, I don't know. And he, he took my idea, ran with it. And this is back when I was playing SWOTOR um, on stream, I should say. And he really like took it to heart and he put his passion into it and all that. And I said to him, I was like, dude, why don't you do this for your career? And when, and I've been thinking about this for a long time. And so him and I just started talking about business stuff, nothing crazy. And then fast forward three, four months from there, I'm playing destiny. And I was, again, another random conversation between us. And I said to Atrax, I'm like, dude, it's time to go to work. And he's like, what do you mean? 
I was like, it's time to go to work. I'm hiring you. And he's like, what? I was like, I'm hiring you. He's like, but I'm uh, 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 kind of like a bunch of stubbles. I was like, look it, I'm going to pay you X amount of dollars. You're going to, you're going to create videos and you're going to do it. And he goes, but, but, and okay. So, but I had one stipulation that I wanted him to create a business. This is the da- incoming dad. Cause I didn't want to introduce him as a tracks. I wanted to be like, Hey, Oh, hire this company. So through this past couple months, um, we've been working together. If you go to my YouTube channel because of a tracks, all of the working class nerds is up there. If you look at the videos, there's real actual videos and shorts that he has created for me, but it's not a tracks making it. Who is it? A tracks. It's uh it's Greenbot, good old Greenbot videos. That's that's the name I'm gonna go by for uh, for the official official video editing stuff. I got a logo which is uh, a green robot, you know, kind of fitting. I think like Greenbot itself is already a thing, but Greenbot videos is like the official name uh, that I'm running with, and yeah. It's been it's been a long time coming. I've been uh pretty nervous about it, but I'm happy to get things going and I'm excited to see where we go with not just your videos, but all sorts of other content and videos to make too. Well, making videos isn't easy. I don't know. I know Doc, you've made a couple <laughs> or a few or a lot. I know myself, I I've tried and I was like, this is way too much work. It is a lot of work. And it's, it's, uh, it's a tricky thing when you try to teach yourself too. Cause I, that was one of my biggest, excuse me. One of my biggest like stresses was I've taught myself everything that I know how to do. You know, if I see something cool in the editing world where I'm like, oh, that's what I want to do. I just look up a YouTube video or there's some way to figure out how to do it and being able to now use like your content Marcus and do all sorts of fun stuff with it. Cause it's, it's fun to work with you when you come, you're like, dude, I've got this clip. Like I did a three K last night. It was my first one ever. And I'm super hype about it. And you give me this clip and it's like, it makes it easy to just, you know, kind of put a little bit of flavor on it and, spice it up and that's an exciting process for me i like that i really like that creative process when someone has you know there's this clear idea and then getting to kind of assist and cut all the pieces together and well with any video there's always a clip or a segment that you use but it's up to you to make that video exciting for people to want to watch right right and to determine what information is important and where it should be on the screen. Cause like for shorts, you know, it's, you have to remember that the bottom portion of the screen and part of the side will be covered. Cause there's like the icons and the like, and the comments and all that. And then the title at the bottom, but then for a normal video, you know, you don't have that cut off at the bottom. So you have to reorganize everything and it's, yeah, there is a little bit more that goes into it. For sure. Well, I'm super excited. Yeah, I'm super excited for it. Where can everybody find you to be able to hire you, commission you, do whatever? I don't know what it's called to hire somebody for videos. I I think it would pretty much be commission. Yeah, or I, I yeah, I don't know what the official term is either. I should probably figure that out. But uh, greenbotvideos at gmail dot com is the best place. Right. Email me and we can, uh, you know, determine what the scope of the project is, figure out, you know, what the idea is, what all the work is involved, render times, things like that. And and I know I'm, price. I'm throwing you kind of under the bus here, but if I, if I had a clip that I said, Hey, I have this clip, it's a 30 second clip. I really want to make this a short, what would that cost? Uh, Probably like 15, 20 bucks. Okay. It would be for something for like under a minute. 
Yeah, probably. It would probably so be. So to do a short, on, whether it's TikTok yeah. or or YouTube, whatever it is. Yeah. I would say if you wanted it for all platforms, like in the different, you know, formats and stuff. Yeah. 20 bucks. All right. For a short. And then if it's longer than a minute, you know, then it just depends on how edited it needs to be and all that stuff, you know, right? because it's a larger project. Sure. So what else have you been up to, Mr. Greenbot? So, yeah. So I, speaking of editing and recording stuff, I recorded my first episode of Guardians of the Galaxy. I'm playing through the video game for my first YouTube series. I've spent an incredible amount of time trying to figure out what game because I wanted something that I hadn't played that I hadn't heard of very much but that at least some people that I know would enjoy watching because you know if you can't entertain your friends then you probably won't entertain strangers at least that's how I kind of view content creation so I finally decided on Guardians of the Galaxy it's on Game Pass um i I've been having a lot of fun with it. I played, I recorded like an hour this morning um, and have been chopping it up into, hopefully I want to get it to be like half an hour to 45 minutes for the episode, which seems long, but I think that, you know, you have to build the world and all of that. I don't know. I'm hoping to make it as entertaining as possible. Um, So we'll be improving with that. Do you have the camera on you? When you're I, playing it? I don't. For this series, I don't. I'm going to try and make it voice only. Because a lot of my favorite content creators currently have that style. So okay. I'm I'm making a go of it in that respect. Um, so yeah. That's, Marcus, don't you have a strong opinion about that? Yes. I know he I, does. Oh, yeah. Well, so, but here's the... I don't, I do I believe if you're going to be on Twitch live streaming, I want to see your face, right? But I do watch YouTube videos where there's nobody on the screen. So it's kind of like, I, I guess I'll have to watch one of those like videos in his and see if I can still connect to him as he's playing Guardians of the Galaxy without a camera. But you're right. I do believe if you're going to Twitch stream, put the camera on you. And this is also like my first series that I'm really determined to, you know, play through the entire game and record it and edit it. And, you know, it's the first one. Maybe the next game that I play, I'll have the camera on and, you know, we'll experiment and see where that goes. But that's I'm starting that and I'm I'm determined to make them regular, you know, put out an episode every week, every two weeks, whatever I can to make make sure that it's edited well and entertaining, but also regular the um um, but don't forget too you say 45 minutes is a long time but don't forget people watch complete playthroughs of games right getting to end right in their series like hour-long episodes of them just playing the missions of the game like i start playing and i don't stop playing it until it's done so i believe people will come yeah we'll see and if I haven't played we'll the game, so I'll enjoy out. watching it because I do. I thought about it a lot. Somebody asked me what my favorite Marvel movie was or Marvel, Marvel like movies. Right. And it was really hard for me not to say the guardians of the galaxy just because of the humor. Right. Yep. I really enjoyed the two of them as well. Both, both movies I thought were and very st- good. And still my favorite scene is the opening of Guardians of the Galaxy 2 where Groot's dancing and they're fighting that monster. Keep yelling at him to stay out of the way because he's going to get hurt. Yeah. Like Groot can't get hurt. <laughs> right. Right. So I'm I'm excited to get that going and really dive into that in the, in the coming weeks. Also, one of the uh, kind of moving on here, one of the things I thought was crazy that happened, I think, earlier today. I don't know if you guys have heard about this. Marcus, I know you watched Squid Game. And yes. if I remember correctly, you really liked it. Well, Netflix announced Squid Game The Challenge, which is a real-life Squid Game for millions of dollars. But obviously, it's not like you're going to die. But they have, but the, the premise Lame. is basically the same. Yeah, right? If you're going to do it, you got to go all in. Go all the way, right? Well, if if you're interested, you can. 
I, I don't, I didn't look too much into it. I just watched the trailer, but you can apply right now to be a contestant if you want to, if you want to be one of the 400 some odd contestants, it's, um, I think it's like squid game, the challenge.com or something like that. I'll, uh, I'll look it up here real quick. Yeah. So, you know, for me, it's like, I hope like, a squid game the challenge here i go yeah squidgamecasting.com it's 4.56 million dollars is the winning prize oh i am definitely going to do this they have us uk and then global casting this is going to be huge how far yeah. will you go yep but here's the thing they may you know you may say you might die like die, but I guarantee there's going to be something in there where like you could get a broken arm. Oh, I'm sure that it's going to be extreme. Yeah. Cause like, they said they're going to do some original squid game games. And there's also going to be some new challenges as well. Yeah. So red light, green light, I'm sure is going to be in it. Right. And they're probably going to shoot you with like BB gun. Yeah. Or like a paintball or something. Oh no, I'm sure it's got to hurt. Like you're going for $4.56 million. Like they're going to have to, like, there's going to have to be real danger. Like it's not, it's not going to be like, uh, like baby shit. Right. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you're no, it's going to be legit. Like, do you remember that show? Most extreme elimination. I don't oh, actually get eliminated. Well, anyway, they did some crazy shit on that show or like fear factor shit. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, and people were doing that for like 10 grand. Imagine what you're going to do for $4.56 million. That's true. That's a good point. What do I you think, think about it, Doc? I think that you're setting it up to be something that it's not actually going to be. What do you think it's going to be? I think it'll be somewhere between um, Ninja Warrior and, like, what would you do? Like, it's going to have cheese ball nonsense, and um, it's people are going to watch it because it's on Netflix. Sorry, I'm a downer about this. I'm not enthusiastic about reality show Squid Game. That's um, fair. It is a reality show. Yeah, I I think it's I think that it's very likely not going to be the best thing ever. Probably. But I I just thought it was interesting that they've now turned it into a real thing and they did announce that season 2 for Squid Game is coming out. Yes. So that's exciting. You know, that's that's probably the better more exciting news of the two. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's cool. I thought the first season was exceptional and as a counselor who does a lot of work with gambling addiction, I thought the first half of the show and even the way that they were reacting to some of the challenges was a really good masterclass in all of the psychological mistakes gamblers make, which right. is probably not what a regular human being is fixated on when they watch that show, but it really did capture the full spectrum of all the different thinking mistakes that people addicted to different gambling games will make. Including the danger of people wanting to break your face in because you owe them money. Well, I was, you know, so everybody sees that show differently you know what I felt like the saddest part for that show was this dude was so addicted to gambling. He gave up on his daughter. And oh, that's an easy choice, Marcus. No, it's not. I wouldn't give up shit for my kids. Do you have a gambling addiction? I don't. Well, that's why. Well, I know that I'm just There's saying so many other people on this planet that can love your daughter. Like, just go win. Uh, but I never win. Ven always gets the God roll. Anyways. Um, oh, my gosh. Can I talk about that really quick? Sure. 
one of the posts on my website is on a mental health moment about rating relationships. And I used it to talk about this concept in family therapy called a relationship triangle, which is basically when two people have something they really need to talk about one-on-one, but they bring a third person in who doesn't even belong in the conversation. And so I'm always thinking about clinical stuff, even when I'm playing video games. And that night was Death Star Troopers, the name of our raid team in SOTOR. Yep. And Ven, Ven was in that team too. And so the screenshot, the banner image for this blog post is us. We just cleared Calpheus in Dread Palace. And I believe the person with the shield icon above their head sitting in the throne while the rest of us are at the bottom posing. I believe that that is Ven's character. He's just up there chilling <laughs> in the chair. So Ven, you, and me in avatar form are on my website as the banner image for one of my posts. That's funny. Nice. That's awesome. So, Marcus, what have you been up to? I'm just going to start with some uh, disappointing news that I found out today about YouTube. So, in order to get monetized on YouTube, you need a thousand watch hours and you need a no, 4,000 watch hours and you need a thousand subscribers. That's how you get partnered with YouTube, right? Well, I found out today that YouTube shorts do not count towards your watch hours. Really? Rip that guy. Ooh, that's rough. Yep. But street live streaming does. Everything does except shorts. Shorts are just content. So if you're trying to make YouTube partner and just using shorts. Dude. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, But that's, that's a Debbie downer, but I'm also talking about that clip that we made where I got a three pack in the trials of Osiris. The first time doing it, that might be my favorite clip of all time. That was, uh, that has been made. Like there's a lot of them of me killing raid bosses, but those raid bosses, I spent months and months and months. So like the emotion of winning those was huge where getting a three pack in the first night of playing the hardest PVP content in destiny. It was like, Whoa, you know what I mean? Like, okay, I could, oh, yeah. if I practice at this game, I can do it. That's what I kept saying to myself. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, and, Like I got all the emotion and honestly, everybody I'm having so much fun doing it and I'm doing it in a way that I like. And what I mean by that is it's not, I'm not stressing myself out doing the hardest content in the game. Like I don't have to do the hardest content in the game to enjoy the game where For years now, I got to be a NIM Raider. I have to be a NIM Raider. I have to be a NIM Raider. And it was a goal. But like, once I got it, I was like, it's not worth it. You know what I mean? And there's nothing wrong with being a story mode hero. Where before I was like, uh, uh, I don't want to do that. It's not hard. Blah. And now I'm just like, why can't I just hang out with my friends and just go kill a boss? Just have fun with the game. Yeah. And I have one more gripe. It's about Final Fantasy 14. To the developers who make that game, I hate you. Because you're making me do all of the content in order to be able to raid with my friends. Like, I wish you would just let me be 80 or get to max level and just do it like SWOTOR does and not lock raids and stuff behind story rant over. I didn't know that. That's interesting. Wow. Yeah, You have to do the whole goddamn story in order to be able to do all the goddamn raids. (laughs) That's not exactly true. 
if you have money, which oh. you just said the SWOTOR thing. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to call you out, Marcus. You could pay for a story completion pass that will take a Realm Reborn, Heaven's Word, Stormblood, and Shadowbringers and complete them for you. Then all you have to do is play Endwalker. And everything before Endwalker will be open for you so you can raid with these friends that you are trying to make us believe that you have in game. I don't have Ooh. any friends. But, but uh, now Doc... <laughs> I'm your friend. I'm, <laughs> I'm one of your best friends, Marcus. Thanks, Jenny. Um, oh. so, so, but I will come back at that and say, I also brought that up and the comments that I got from you and Wes were, if you do the story skip, good luck because you're not even going to know how to fight some of these bosses because it's going to be too hard. But you don't know how to fight them right now anyway. So you're better off not knowing and going in and getting killed and just causing the healer to focus on you. Or they could just leave you dead and kill the boss without you. That's it's, the beautiful thing about Final Fantasy XIV. All right. Looks like I'm paying for a story skip tonight. Let's go. Let's go. Um, also, too, thank you to everybody that has been coming to stream. I've been having a lot of fun. And... What I'm finding about the game is I'm like finding my niche of playing Destiny where like Tuesday nights are clan night, but Saturdays and Sundays have become almost like a, what do I want to do today? And it seems like every activity I do, somebody wants to join in and have fun with me for the night. You know what I mean? And I feel less obligated to do the hardest content because you know i don't have to you know what i mean you're having and, fun otherwise right exactly and i'm having so much fun with it i really truly am and it's it's awesome that people are coming people are coming to the discord hanging out i do have a regret i took my kids to barnes and noble yesterday and I was leaving with my kids because they got some new books for the summer. And there was a dad joke book on clearance for nine bucks. And it said, it's a ponderful world. And I regret not turning around and walking back in the store and buying that book. Oh, uh, you didn't buy it, Sam. Nope. Yep. Rip that guy. Uh, but other than that, it's really been a crazy time with work and everything else happening so i've been focusing less on everything but work like just it's been crazy maybe it's that time of year maybe it's the summer just hitting in i don't know but anyway the last thing for me is obi-wan finally after five episodes finally has me hooked like this past week was the best episode of obi-wan yet By i'm not far. gonna spoil it too much um and all i'm gonna say is there's a part in episode five where i wish that was in episode two because i believe that seeing those two together having the conversation that they did would have made so much more sense back for attack of the clones for me what did you guys think about this episode and what do you guys think of the show period so far doc you go first i i i see you like <laughs> okay so from past episodes of Working Class Nerds, I have shared consistently, also consistently throughout my whole life, that Anakin Skywalker is my favorite Star Wars character. Sure. So anything that puts Anakin and Darth Vader in the same space and unifies them into being the same fictional character harmoniously 
is going to make me happy. It's going to make me ecstatic. It's going to make all the positive reaction centers in my brain of dopamine just explode until they die. And probably the last time I felt about Star Wars the way I do about the Kenobi show was in Star Wars Rebels when Vader has his showdown with Ahsoka. Yes. And and that was s- such a beautiful moment years ago now uh, because the helmet gets damaged. You see Anakin's eye in there and you hear both voices. And so what episode five of Obi-Wan did by putting two different sequences of time overlapping with each other and then putting Darth Vader in a situation where he needed to use some of the lessons from Anakin pre-episode two in order to be in complete control of the situation. It was beautiful storytelling that might be a spoiler but you know darth vader's not going to die in the obi-wan kenobi show just in case any working class nerds people are uncertain of whether he'll make it or not obi-wan's going to be fine as well by the way so um i love it it's peak star wars for me you know last time i was on the show or one of the last times mandalorian was new we talked about how we're getting to see the bounty hunter story using SWOTOR lingo. And now we're back to seeing the Jedi Knight story, but it's like an actual Jedi Knight, not whatever Luke was when he got to be on screen. Oh, I, I can't Um, agree more. I mean, we've been all hungry for lightsabers for years. Mm -hmm. And in the last year, we've gotten so many lightsabers in real live action that I feel like the circle is now complete. I I think also that this time period is the best time period in the story of Star Wars with the Empire in complete control of the galaxy. And that makes hope a sparse resource. And whenever your heroes have that kind of adversity, the mythological feel in the story is elevated because you can't have a great hero without a unbeatable villain. And then the problem solving in our brains just wants to believe that unbeatable, eh, let's do this. Yep. And some people have argued, I've I've heard that some people, oh, well, I don't like the fact that we know how the story ends and stuff. And for me personally, that that doesn't bother me because I still, like you just mentioned, I love the problem solving of like, well, we know this certain outcome, right? We know the outcome of Obi-Wan. We know the outcome of Vader. But it's cool to see when these characters get put in these scenarios, how they figure out their way and how in in a way that makes sense. If they do it a little too unrealistically, then you kind of lose a sense of story and it's like, Oh, well they just have plot armor, but I think this is well done. And in a way that makes sense, at least for me, I, I don't know. I'm not one of the most versed star Wars lore fans, but for me as just, I'd say a casual viewer, I really enjoy it, and I think that the story makes sense. One other thing I want to add, too, that I've really appreciated is the level of visual effects and production that has gone into these episodes, because each one feels and has the movie high-quality level of production. And I haven't noticed any weird... You know, I'm sure there are some if you played it back super slow, but you don't notice any weird, you know, um, visual effects or like, oh, that character looks kind of, you know, shaky or I don't know. They they look otherworldly. They don't look like they fit there. Clearly, that's a CGI character. They've done a super good job of blending their practical and visual effects together in a way that, you know, 
it makes every character feel real and every um move you know force and otherwise feel like it has power you know you can feel the weight behind everything it's it's super neat you know forever you know okay so fun fact if you don't know this and i learned this from rob kaz who's an artist for lucasfilm uh one of the paintings up on my wall is rob kaz and he explained to me that when he met george lucas they talked about darth vader and Darth Vader was so terrifying that he had a cape, but George Lucas never allowed his cape to f- swing through the air. So if you watch the original movies, his cape is never flying through the air, no matter what he's doing. And cause he always wanted it still, but now that Disney has it, his cape is flying all over the place. But what I'm going to say about Darth Vader, he's fucking terrifying. Like yep. this last episode of Obi-Wan, I must have said it six times because I've been watching it at my uncle's house with Nick in a, in the basement on the 86 inch TV with the crazy theater sound system and going, Vader is fucking terrifying. Like my jaw is on the ground. Like the most terrifying Vader has ever been for me was the first time he walked through that door when the stormtroopers blew a hole through the, the ship. You know what yep. I mean? When you mm-hmm. first saw him, like that was the most terrifying. I was like, Oh damn, who the hell is this guy? You know what I mean? And now, I mean, in the things that he did in this episode alone, I I was just like, I was terrified. That's all I can say. Cause I'm trying not to spoil it. Cause it just came out, but right. terrifying. His technique in the battle that he was in, in episode five, it took what Luke did to Kylo Ren in episode eight. I, I was getting major vibes there um, because there was there was a specific detail. I'm not spoiling it. Darn it. Oh, hard. Okay. There's a specific detail about the way they were fighting where it's like, oh, oh, he's he's going to do it that way. Yep. So yep. good. So good. Like the superiority of Darth Vader as the boogeyman. And that's one of the things that um, yeah, that's a great way to put it. The book, a man. lot of the a lot of the Star Wars books, like Tarkin and Thrawn, and um, that one where Darth Vader and the Emperor are having their buddy Sith adventure in the woods, um, they really create this picture, this persona for Darth Vader that if you see him that's the last thing you're going to see that the emperor doesn't send him after people unless this situation is closing done go home empire wins and as a result of that a lot of people in the future rebellion they don't know what darth vader is because if he walks down that hallway you're done and that's the darth vader that we're seeing in this show He's in his mid thirties, which is like peak physical ability before it starts really declining, you know, thinking about professional sports, like that age where you still have a chance to seriously win stuff. Uh, but in a couple of years, you're not, you're going to need help. Um, well, so a new hope Vader is 10 years older than this. Well, and you know, you see it with the Obi-Wan in the beginning. In the mm-hmm. first couple episodes, like he's weak, he's out of practice. And I think that makes more of sense for Vader in episode four, that once the Obi-Wan storyline is done and Vader moves on, like he, I, he doesn't really use his lightsaber much, much more, you know, after rebels, you know what I'm saying? It's pretty much done then. And then he just starts to be the scary guy in a mask with the old, uh, you know, ancient ways. 
Yeah, Tarkin says some pretty messed up stuff to him in A New Hope. That kind of shows you the hierarchy of the Empire, too, that, you know, in that time period, Tarkin is probably more valuable than Darth Vader. Right, because uh, they already have... And the to. Emperor loves that, right? Like, that's that's the fun thing about the about Emperor Palpatine and his personality type, which I probably know a bit about. Um, best best personality type there is, right, Marcus? I'm just outgoing. Uh, so last thing is um, this Sunday, I'm going to have a huge announcement. Uh, Marcus has a holiday coming up. I'm going to be announcing it. It's going to be a big 12-hour stream event. So you're going to want to tune in Sunday night for the big announcement in AIE news uh, Tuesdays is destiny Two's clan night every week. We do our pinnacles together because it's the weekly reset. We have fun stuff to do. It's really become a really fun thing. Um, this week we got all of our pinnacles done out of like the base. I call them the tripod, which is gambit crucible, which is PVP and our strikes, but we got it all done. It was a lot of fun. So whether or not you're in the clan, you play Destiny 2, come join us. And if you do not play Destiny 2, know that it's free to play to start. And the the original campaign uh, mission that you do to like learn how to play the game, I can join you on that. So uh, if you decide to play, just ping me and we can go and do the new light campaign. So if all this sounds fun to you, go to AIE-Guild.org. Go to the top right-hand corner of the webpage. Click that button. It takes you to our Discord. What's awesome about our Discord? It has all of the games that we play. Star Wars The Old Republic, Destiny 2, Guild Wars 2, World of Warcraft, Lost Ark, V Rising, whatever that is, Minecraft Dungeons. People are playing Lego. It doesn't matter because we would love to have you. Now. Because Nick isn't here, I don't need to go to the bathroom. I don't think they need to go to the bathroom. So there's going to be no break because we do not have the bladder the size of a pea. But what are we the talking about today? Huh? Yeah, he the size of a paintball. That's a great idea. So this week's episode, we're bringing Doc back. He's here. He's ready to break it down. We're going to be talking about cons and panels and panels and cons. And how did Dr. Gameology go from teaching in all of these classrooms across the country? Now he's teaching people at conventions all across the country about mental health and games. So, Doc, how did you end up at a con in the first place? Well... I started doing some presentations for a company called Geek Therapeutics. So at the end of 2020, I did a two-hour presentation for their counselors about the Old Republic study that I did that started me out towards earning my PhD. And so that study... I, I sort of hinted about Emperor Palpatine's personality type, and that's actually really important to me because it's my personality type. It's the INTJ. And that's introvert, intuitive, thinking, and uh, judgment, lifestyle. Uh, we call it the mastermind. And so when I created my Star Wars character... I created a Sith Sorcerer, which is the same fighting style in SWOTOR world as what Emperor Palpatine would have. So that whole character creation thing put me on this path to the psychology of video games, right? So now that topic started really small and really focused, and now the topic is very wide and can reach anything. So I did that presentation. They asked me if I'd be interested in doing another one. I did a presentation then with a full playthrough included in the PowerPoint of Journey. And Journey is, of course, another game that is incredibly important to me for a lot of reasons. We can't go into all of that today, maybe in a future Why not? episode. Uh, because I can't, Marcus. There are a few things that I need to have um, 
in writing before I can explain more about Journey. Oh, okay. Uh, I see but it's a, it's a very important game to me. It takes about an hour and a half to complete. And it really does hit you in the feelings, especially if you've had anything in your life that you've battled for for a long time. And then you get it and it's uh, transformative and you feel sure. like a different person by being able to complete that. And so I did, I did SOTOR for this company. I did Journey for this company. And then they were looking for panelists who were willing to go out to Seattle for PAX West to talk about Soulsborne games. And have I you just, ever played that before? Yes. During my master's program, I was heavily into the original Demon Souls. Oh, wow. Yes. And so that is where I really fell in love with the idea of difficult games, RPG in a dismal fantasy setting, dark fantasy setting, and playing as a magic caster. And all these things are consistent for me across any game I'm going to play, is I'm going to make it dark and I'm going to win with magic. Um, with So I've only ever played a game like that, which was uh, Jedi Fallen Order. I've never actually played a game like that before that. But isn't it true that, like, you say you're a magic caster, but aren't those games made for melee combat? Like, isn't I mean, it I'm... made to be, like, melee? It it depends. I think you can build it any way you want. They've made, they make some magic, you know, options viable. At least they try to. Okay. Yeah. So in my build that I'm using for Elden Ring right now, I actually don't carry a shield most of the time. They're just heavy. They weigh you down. What I do is I have in my right hand the Sword of Night and Flame, which has magic properties, and it scales based on your intelligence stat. So rather than having a sword where its primary strength comes from strength, because I don't have much of that, I'm scaling with my magical abilities. So okay. that sword benefits from my magic focus, so I can still attack with melee. But then in my left hand is my wizard staff. Oh. And, and so I'm able to roll around with a light load. So I have the quickest speed I possibly can. Right. I want to stay far away if I have magic points or um, vitality. No, vitality is health. If I have mind points... Focus points. That's what they're called. Um, so if I have my blue bar, then I want to stay far away and throw projectiles at the enemy. If I don't, I want to drink my uh, mind potion that will give me those blue points back and hope I don't die while I'm drinking. And uh, if I don't feel like I have the opening to do that, that's when it's sword time. And it's so I, interesting to me. Yeah, I've actually completed Elden Ring three times now i got the darkest ending yesterday whoa tell us about that is that your uh, third well through for the darkest? yeah that was yeah so um i i chose the path where you go deep down into the deepest dungeon in the capital city and you unlock the door to the three fingers and then they imbue you with the frenzied flame and so that turns your eyes fiery the rest of the playthrough unless you do an elaborate side quest to cure yourself. So you could undo the dark ending after you meet the three fingers if you're really driven to do that. But I wanted this ending because it was one of the endings with an achievement attached to Interesting. it. Interesting. Yeah. Achievement hunters. Let's go. Yeah, I have, I have 10 achievements left for Elden Ring. I don't know how much more time I will need to take to get them. I don't really know what six of them are because they're still hidden. But, you know, I think I think 32 out of 42 in that game is pretty good also. No kidding. Yeah. Yeah, that is... I I can't even understand that game. I see people play it, and believe it or not, that's kind of become my, like... 
I'll never part play time it Twitch, free. Twitch hobby. Like I'll go into Elden Ring because I'll never play the game, right? But I'll find somebody that's saying first playthrough, and I'll watch them. And my favorite thing, believe it or not, is somebody I now I don't follow them, and then they die. A, a painful death and I use my rip that guy emote and it instantly always gets the streamer to smile and laugh because it's like, yep, this is dead. And when uh, Atrax was playing it, he had a death counter. I think it was the greatest thing ever. Oh man. Yeah. That death counter went up real fast. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, um, but again, watching people play that and be able to take that punishment over and over again. I don't know if I could do that. Even though I, when I raid, right. Even though when I raid it's, I die over and over and over again. I just don't think like when you're raiding with eight people, like seven other people and you die, most of the time it's not your fault. I mean, sure, sometimes it is, but not every time. But in Elden Ring, it's every time you die, it's your fault. And I think it would just eat me up. I don't think I, I can... actually would prefer that it's my fault, Marcus. You've yeah, raided think... with me. You know how frustrated I get when we're dying and I did everything right. Yeah. It's the worst. Yeah, that'd be more frustrating. I, I agree. That'd be more frustrating. It's I think it's harder to deal with if you did everything right and you still lost than if you did something wrong and you lost. Because then you just lose is improve, right? Yeah. So I want to share something. This is a mental health tip here for ever acquiring important lessons. Fail. I like Forever that. acquiring important lessons. I fail a lot. Well, failure, the best teacher is Marcus. No, for it sure. It also makes for some of the best content. Oh, yeah, I, I agree. Um, I just get it's hard when you're streaming and you're dying over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, especially if it's the same boss over and over and over. I feel like. Uh, it was, um, I feel I don't know how to say it. I feel like I feel like it's harder for me to deal with loss when I'm live. A hundred percent. I'd agree with yeah, that. Like I agree with that too. Like, I don't stream Elden Ring, by the way. Um, It's just sure. not a good situation for me. Yeah, it's hard when you're playing poorly in front of other people. Even if it's your friends, you feel bad. But especially if it's strangers on Twitch, you know, just usernames. Yeah. And I'm not saying, I mean, I'm sure that a majority of people on Twitch, you know, enjoy watching people fail over and over again. But yeah, I, I can definitely relate to that where I, and I had to take a break from streaming for a little bit because it got bad enough to where I was, I was really stressed out about like, you know, you've play poorly in counter strike or something like that a game where uh if you if you get wrecked it's pretty obvious and it's not it's not very fun cuz you're just sitting there like at the dead screen and that can yeah that can really wear on you mentally but then there's also the times where you do really really good and then you pop off that feels super good too but i would definitely say that losing feels worse than winning feels good Mm. I just found that losing was an opportunity to think about what just happened and your problem solving in, in those games so much that I don't feel like the streams um, are, are what I'm supposed to be doing right now. I'm, I'm trying really hard to figure things out 
And so I, once I stopped streaming Elden Ring, I actually didn't play it in March or April at all, really. And then I switched from playing it on PS5 in my living room to playing it on Steam during work breaks and things like that. And that really helped me to figure out how to enjoy the game because it it was just something for me to problem solve alone and and that worked in a way that was it wasn't my living room and it wasn't my twitch channel anymore um oh we got completely distracted though so i i went to seattle <laughs> last <laughs> fall Oh, yeah, and talked right. and talked about the psychology of playing these games. So we talked about failure and we talked about uh, choosing our stats and we talked about problem solving and we talked about even when the challenges are the toughest, we still keep coming back to figure them out. And these are all really good lessons that people can use in their day-to-day -day life if they're driven to figure things out in their personal quest the way that people who complete dark souls and bloodborne if they're you know if you're just as driven in life to do something as you are in a game like that who knows what you can accomplish by the time you're ready to rest and i agree i can't yeah. agree with you more um we call that the sidebar and it was a good one but for me, well, you talked about what your first panel was. How did you feel? Huh, talking to the counselor about how did you feel? How did you feel when you walked up there for the first panel and there's a crowd there? And I know as you know, you, you're a professor, you speak in front of people all the time. You're always doing like conferences. I know that, but like it has to feel a little different but maybe not when you're in the front of a room of like professionals versus gamers who mm -hmm. are there to hear about it. You know what I mean? So how did it make you feel when you walked out there for that first time? Yeah. So it was a really cool moment in terms of my growth and the way I chose my path the last seven years, I had put fan conventions on this pedestal where I felt like I needed to do more in order to deserve to be there. And once I started interacting with the people in Geek Therapeutics and talking about this goal like that, they kindly let me know, you've already done enough, you need to be up there. And so that really flipped it. It, it helped my confidence a lot, but you go in there you see the backdrop that says PAX West on it. And I had never gone to PAX, much less been on a panel there. So my first PAX I went to, I'm on this panel. The room was packed, which was really super cool. And I wasn't nervous because like you said, you know, I've presented at professional conferences my entire career probably over 40 of them at this point. So talking in front of people, having a hundred people in front of me, I, I already know for me, what I truly believe is that's no different than talking to the two of you right now. Right. And, and even if, even if thousands of people listen to this episode, that has nothing to do with what I'm saying right now. All I have to do, you know, use a Gandalf quote, right. Um, is the best with the time that's given to me. So someone asked me a question, I answer it. Um, and, you know, I made them laugh. Um, you know, first laugh of the panel was my fault, which was really good. And not for like a failure reason for like, I said something and got the response I was looking for. Um, it was, it was just really great. And I probably got addicted to that feeling because now I just show up everywhere. Well, speaking of showing up everywhere, if, if, if you, if somebody from a, a convention called you and said, Dr. Gameology, 
we want you to do a present a panel. You can do anything you want. What would it be? Personality flow and gaming motivation for Final Fantasy fourteen. Wow. It's like that's you what was I'm there at doing. the tip of your tongue waiting for that question. Oh, man. Every day, Marcus, I'm in those uh, data tables finding new things. And, um, you know, there's actually a set of seven player profiles that we're looking at right now in Final Fantasy XIV. And seeing the personality data, which this is my first study using the five-factor model of personality instead of the Myers-Briggs type indicator. In psychology, there's lots of incredibly intelligent people that have strong feelings about what personality structure you believe in. So this whole thing I'm doing is like, fine, fair enough. I'll use the other one. Now what are you going to do? Yeah. Yeah. Right, Marcus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, of course, think both of them are great and they both have blind spots that the other one sees better. And also, it turns out whether it's SWOTOR players or Final Fantasy XIV players, you see a lot of the same things. They're both MMORPGs. They're both impossible fictional settings. You're just trading the Mother Crystal for the Force. Would you say that personality types in MMO gaming are... Like there's in both games, now that you've done a study on both SWOTOR and Final Fantasy, they're both, they have the same personality types in them, like for the most part. Because I'm sure there's a lot of introverts that play MMOs. Oh, yeah. The majority of people that play MMOs are going to have an introverted personality type. So the study oh, I did I'm was the minority. SWOTOR. I'm in you, the minority of that. <laughs> yes, um, in that way. You know, going back to SWOTOR Unite, Marcus, um, me and my scheming mastermind ideas, hey, it would be really great if we had all the SWOTOR content creators come together and do the new raid. Yeah. And then you heard that idea and instantly had 90% of them saying yes in the next 30 minutes. Um, that's not what i do that's what you do <laughs> um so the difference though in the two research studies is introversion and extroversion with the swotor study which used the myers-briggs personality structure you get a clear indicator of i or e introvert or extrovert and then you get a strength counter on that as well so there's deep introversion moderate and mild, and then same for the other side. With the Final Fantasy study, I use the five-factor model, and you don't get introversion there. You just get low extroversion. Okay? <sighs> so it's a, it's a different way of scaling it. I'm thinking that. I'm thinking that through. Yeah, so you have an, a high extroversion in you. Oh, because you just you just go in, gather all the people. Uh, you thrive on that crowd. Whereas I don't want the crowd. I just want the execution. So if it's a scale of one to a hundred on extroversion, I'm happy being in my thirty-five out of a hundred. Right, low. Right. One third of the points are on my character sheet, and you're like 88 out of 100, maybe, maybe <laughs> yeah. even 98 on a bad day, which oh, you would call bad. a good day, right? You would call that a good day, but I would call it a nightmare or a savage situation, <laughs> depending on which MMO we're playing together. It's either sure. a savage or extreme or nightmare. Uh, Atrax, would you say you're an introvert or an extrovert? I I am definitely an introvert. It's funny. There was this uh, when I was 
going through doing some video editing courses on Udemy, there's this uh, one of the guys, he said, you know, video editors are a lot like mushrooms. You know, we do a great job when we're just in this nice, dark, cool place. We can sit for hours and we don't need a whole lot of sun. That's me. I, I, I can be very productive when I'm just, you know, kind of by myself. I can sit and do my work and everything like that. I do. I wouldn't say that I am like super, super, super introverted where I just, I, I can't stand people. I do enjoy meeting new people and getting to know new people, you know, like, so I have, I do have that social aspect, but it's very, um, I, I don't want to say random, but it's like, okay, I have my time with people. Now I'm done. I'm going to go back and, you know, a majority of the time I like to spend by myself. So I would, I would definitely say I'm introverted for sure. You know, it's funny hearing this. I'll tell you what, in this, I work with people all day. Like I'm around people all day, but my favorite time of day is when I get to come down here into my office. But then again, I'm, if I, if I'm in front of here, I'm always chatting with somebody or streaming in front of people. So I guess that's, just, that's just continuing it. Anyways, um, doc, what is the, your favorite city you got to visit so far for a, a, a con? I thought it was going to be Boston, but then one of my favorite people was too busy with work and it oh, became awesome. less cool of a city than I thought it was going to be. The worst uh, so timing ever. I me. would say Philadelphia actually is the one that I enjoyed the most. We had an amazing room. Um, you know, it was the top floor of a really old hotel looking down on some other really old building. Um, it was around Christmas time. So there was all the Christmas stuff out front and we did a lot of walking. We did the bus tour. We got to see the Liberty Bell. Um, yeah, I think, I think easily Philadelphia was my favorite, but there were things we did in Massachusetts that I had a lot of fun with. Uh, we went and did um, one of the uh, Salem Witch Trial Museum tours. Yep. Yeah, uh, that was a lot of fun for me. Uh, and, of course, the Tea Party uh, experience. That was that was interesting. Yep. Um, so just also... You know, I bring my family with me. So my son, he's a teenager now. And so my wife, we're, you know, all three of us, we're, we're trying to do things to get the city, even though we have these passes to do the convention. So what we do is we would do things in the city and then we just go to the convention on days where I don't have the panel. And that would be like 3 to 4.30 and just you know walk around find some things to do and that's kind of my way of enjoying the conventions i i don't see them as an all day thing really um cuz you run out of money too um yeah. just buying things and shopping and being like oh this is cool i'll never find it again so i kind it's kind of a a survival tactic as well. Just doing part of the afternoon. It, I remember that weekend. So I had a three day pass. My plan was I was going, we had a hotel room, we had it already. And then my work collapsed. Like if there was something that could have gone wrong, it went wrong five times. And I worked the Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday that week for about 12 to 14 hours a day because shit went wrong and it's like the worst timing ever, but sometimes, you know, got to do what you got to do. Well, you were down in my city just weeks after that, and I couldn't make it to your gathering either. So right. it just well, happens. Yeah. It's funny because we're so busy and like when I'm down in Florida, I pick a day and I'm like, look at, I'm going to this restaurant this time. If you guys can come cool. If not, you can't. 
just like it didn't work out in Boston, but it just shows how busy it proves how busy we both are every single day. Yeah. Guys got a crammed schedule, huh? Yeah. So yeah. Dr. Gameology, then you have a nice crammed schedule. What's your main goal for future panels, like moving forward? Well, the psychology of Pokemon, the power to catch them all is coming out in about two to three weeks as a book that people can buy. And I'm the author of the final chapter for that. So it's we're going to final chapter. Do, 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 do. Right. Okay. So do, do, do. So once we're done promoting that book and the Leyline publications moves on to whatever the next book after that is. So that'll, that'll stop being a thing. That's like the de facto topic. And then there's probably going to be more things with Final Fantasy XIV because we have this study almost done with data analysis. We have the basic findings ready for the Digital Games Research Association in July. And then we're probably going to do a follow-up study, which is where we take the things we learned from this one and then we try to learn some more things in the blind spots to create a more complete discussion. So Final Fantasy XIV is a really good option because it has a thriving player community, constant support, it has resources in it. And so every several months there's new activities, new bosses, new events, new outfits. Um, all the things that draw people in to an MMO space, it has going on in a pretty strong way. And um, so that's one thing. Other things, though, are really interesting to me. There are a few other genres that I'd like to begin doing more focused work in. Uh, for example, we just talked about The Quarry, which came out last week on our podcast that we recorded this week. That will be coming out in about 10 days. And I really love decision-based and moral-based storytelling in video games. And mm -hmm. I like looking at player choice in terms of systemic choice versus fixed point in time decisions. So what I mean by that is you might have a game that has different endings and you get them either by playing a certain way or there was a flashpoint moment in the story where you had to choose up or down, left or right, dead or alive. Uh, and endings in games hinge on those things happening in certain ways. And it's a, it's a game design choice from the developers. So BioWare has a lot of fixed point decision making in it. Whereas... Um, you know, games like Bioshock, the ending hinges on what you did with the little sisters and how many of them you did that choice to. And as a result, how many big daddies you decided to take down. And so the way you play the game determines the ending, but it's not a fixed choice that every single player has to face. So uh, those are systemic interactions with the game environment more so than watching a cutscene and then choosing at the same exact moment that everyone chooses so i really like that kind of stuff yeah that's that's interesting i never thought about it but when you started talking about it i could already see the differences like the difference between something like detroit become human where they are a lot more like you mentioned you click this button or you you know, make it yeah, through it's this scripted. time event. Yeah. Then either you fail or you pass and that splits your, you know, route, whether you go this way or that way, then you have something more like Elden Ring where it's not exactly set in stone. You could go one way or it could go the other way. If you complete something else first, before you did this other thing, then, you know, you're kind of, you miss that section or your ending is altered based off of that. You that's, know? Yeah. That's cool. Hearing you say Detroit become human, I never beat it. 
Um, that's because I'm caught in the MMO hook, and I can't stop playing the games that I play to play it. But I did play the shit out of a game called Indigo Prophecy and Heavy Rain, which are made by the same company who made... Yeah, Quantic Dream. Yeah, Quantic Heavy Dream. Heavy Rain was really good. Heavy Rain is like in my top five games of all time. Me too. Like the emotion that that... How about this? I bought a used PlayStation 3 just to play that game. Wow. Like that was it because the playstation 3 playstation sucks but that Ooh, game, i'm logging out now have a great day thanks nerds <laughs> yeah thanks nerds <laughs> no um no but seriously like the way that game makes you feel even indigo prophecy which is really old style graphics and it was really hard to play but the story was amazing Wait, and, so you didn't like video games at all in 1998, did you, Marcus? What do you mean? You're such a graphics snob. Yeah, so, like, what did you do when games look looked like garbage? Well, I always hated it. I, I was okay. like, why do I like these guys look like blocks? They don't look like real characters. But I, I love it. games that look terrible. Oh, I can't. It Not now. Me. Not now. Like I play. Like when I play Destiny, sometimes I'll just stop and look around. And sometimes you see how it has some dated graphics, but then you play another game and you're like, like go play Tony Hawk Pro Skater 1 for the PlayStation 1. And you're like, whoa, how did Dude, they make I, this game work? I don't know, man. I still crack out some of those old games, but it's more for nostalgia, I think. Well, than... yeah, like we talked about last week, uh, but Nick, they're remaking GoldenEye. That's the greatest yeah. first person shooter of all time. When that happens, Nick is going to get shot multiple times. He's done so. Golden Gun. I can't wait coming. to see it. Yeah, that will be a uh, working class nerds uh, live stream. But anyway, the Heavy Rain game, it was about a serial killer, and it had enough creepiness to it, but it also played with your emotions, and there were so many different endings. I think I only got two endings. I didn't do them all. 21. There's 21 different endings. Yeah. If you take the different endings, th four characters go through to the end. Oh, um, some, some of the endings, two players could be the, or two characters could be the same, but the other two are different. So there's basically 21 combinations in that game. If I remember right. Wow. All right. So that's my point. That game was just amazing. And like, I know occasionally on like the YouTube shorts, I'll see like clips of Detroit become human. And I'm like, man, I really want to play this game, but it's like, I don't have time. And I feel like if I start playing that, like I'm not going to stop playing that game. Cause I think I played it for like an hour and then I was like, okay, I got to play Swotor. But that is so sad. It is sad. Yeah. But it's that's that's what I call the MMO hook. I yep. wish, you know, Doc, I would love for you to write a blog post about the MMO hook and why <laughs> it happens. Because for me in my world, I'm like, well, because the game is never ending, right? Like there's yeah, always perpetuity. something to do. Right. But really truly you can stop playing it anytime you want to go play something else but people that play mmos choose not to oh that would be a really good post for me to write darn you marcus now i have things I'm, i have to do i'm sure it has something to do with the uh um oh what is it or it could be like a video like, a recorded voice video that you do and post it to your youtube sorry there yeah. you go but it's like the idea that, oh, I don't want to miss out on this cool like piece of loot or this one, you know, get this exclusive thing because it's time locked and next expansion, it'll be gone. I won't be able to get it anymore. There's a, there's a specific term for it and I can't remember what it's called. FOMO? Gonna... FOMO. Huh? FOMO? Fear That's... of missing out? 
Yeah, that could be it. That could be it. Fear of missing out. But, you know, but you're right. Every expansion in SWOTOR, I remember, there was always something going going away. Or even uh, in Destiny, when they released the next bit of content, they got rid of old expansions because the game was getting too big. And people went crazy, like, you got to finish all the achievements for that because you'll never be able to do good. And I'm like, that is not me. I am not grinding out achievements because it's going away. You know what I mean? But at the yeah. same time, I don't allow myself to play another game because I, I'm too wrapped up. Oh, shit. I can't go play Detroit Become Human. I got to get another piece of gear to up my gear level. You know what I mean? It's, right. I don't, and I don't know why it happens to me. You know, and I don't, you know, there's other people that only play SWOTOR and that's the only game they play. No matter how many times they repeat the same content, they just love it. So like, I don't know why that happens. Well, Doc, we need a video. Sometimes when you have anxiety, um, it's better to stick with something where you know all the beats so that there are no surprises and there's no things that you are incapable of handling. And so you find comfort in doing something repetitively, whether it's playing a game that you've played the story many times before, reading a book that you've already read before. So you're playing for that sense of security more than you're playing for a new experience or for novelty. Yeah, and I think also there is the fear of like wasting your time on a different game. So if you're really hooked on one, you know, you don't want to play, especially with how I, I think with how reviews I've I've felt this way with how reviews and how widely spoiled everything is in terms of gameplay and everything. You know, when a game comes out, everybody knows just about everything about the game, you know, because it's so widely, you know, everybody's making content for it to entertain, which is fine. I'm not saying that that's a bad thing, but it's just, there is the flip side to it where you hear some of these negative reviews. You don't want to, you know that you have fun playing one game. You don't want to necessarily risk having less of a fun time playing a different game just for the sake of playing something different. You know, you're going to go back to, whatever game you really enjoy, especially if there's this sense of feeling like, oh, well, my level score is now higher. Therefore, it was worth spending that time in this game versus trying something new that I may not have enjoyed. I don't know. I'm not a psychologist. That's just my assumption. You know, that's one thing I had to break for myself is just, all right, well, I want to play, I want to experience all these different games, whether they're good or bad. You know, oh wow, man! Remember when I played that game? Yeah, it was so terrible. Yeah, you know, I can I can draw enjoyment for that. But some people, they might not. You know, they've been like, ah, oh, that was such a waste of my time. I should have just played this game or that game that I play all the time. Yeah. Yep. Wow. All right. Wow. I... My mind is boggled right now. All right. I'm sorry, everybody. We forgot our working class questions from last week. So this is two weeks worth of working class questions. I will start. This question came from Atrax. Uh, Doc, I'll have you answer first. Then I'll ask, actually, I'll answer last and Atrax can go. Who is the best villain in TV show history? Movies and games are excluded. Strictly TV shows. The first thought that I had is uh, the chicken man from Breaking Bad, Giancarlo Esposito. Well, it's mm, a good answer. I feel, I feel like as a video game player and as a Star Wars fan, that's a, a pretty solid answer as well because he was so evil in that show that he is now the permanent default villain in everything video yeah. games mandalorian i'm watching the boys right now and he's a oh, bad yeah. character in that too that's my answer 
That's about you, really Atrax. Answer. For me, I was going to say, and I really want to know what Nick want, is going to say to this too. Uh, but for me, it's Homelander from The Boys. I've oh. I've never, at least personally, I've never run into a character that I have been so like, wow, this guy is terrible. Like in, in every like douchebag evil, though. Yes, but also it's terrifying because he's basically Superman, but he's that terrible. And he acts like to the general public, to a majority of people, they see him as this super nice, great person. It's not even like he's outwardly the villain. It's only us as the viewer and those certain characters that know who he actually is that to me, that's what makes it so terrifying. I don't know. We'll have to see how this, how season three, I haven't watched season three yet. So I have to see how he develops in season three. Marcus, what about you? I've never seen the show. Mm, okay. Um, Highly recommend. I don't, yeah, I don't watch a lot of TV. So it's hard for me to watch, start watching a new show. Right. Right. But my favorite TV villain is Frieza from Dragon Ball Z. So right. Frieza, Frieza came out and this is back when I watched it. Um, he came down to this planet and he was like, and he had different shapes or forms of himself. And each time he changed forms, he got stronger and stronger. But my favorite part was his final form. He was this tiny little twig guy, but the whole time he was always super duper cocky and just rude but diabolically diabolically evil and mm. i i i can't say except that i loved it so much um so in maybe it's cuz i don't watch a lot of tv cuz it's hard for me to say you know the worst tv villain the only the only other villain I could ever think of was the original undertaker when he first came out in wrestling. Cause he okay. was a dark villain way back then. Like yeah. he came after you and he was putting you down six feet under. Right. He was an okay. always good guy. I don't think about wrestling. Like it's a TV show. I think about it. Like it's a metaphor for life. So <laughs> If we were going to go that direction, I probably would have just gone with Triple H or something. Yeah, sure. But all right, it was just that one was my off the seat of my pants kind of thinking about more villains in TV who scared me. And when I was a kid, The Undertaker was terrifying. Yeah. Mm. You know, and and I only ever watched him on TV or except whenever like I got to go to like a wrestling event in one of the cities around me. He was just at MegaCon down here where I had two panels. So I was on the like celebrity guest badge list at an event where the undertaker was. That's awesome. Yeah. And he Were was on, on the, the same list. Sorry. Well, we, we supposedly picked up our badges in the same place. Nice. Um, he uh he was on a podcast and he was like look at for years i didn't even call myself by my real name i was just the undertaker mm. i stayed in character 24 7 wow yeah but that's why he was so good at what he did right uh oh i'm next all right what are your top five cookies this is from stask I don't know if I can even name five cookies. Oh, shit, I can. My top, top, top favorite cookie, Pecan Sandies. You have um, Nutter Butters, Sugar Cookie, Oatmeal Raisin, and then Oreo. I See, I, I also can right off the bat name my top five cookies. Uh, and I'm glad that Oatmeal Raisin is on your list, Marcus. That's like one of the most hated for some dumb reason. I'm I don't want nuts in that shit. Don't ruin a cookie. No, with, yeah, just don't ruin an oatmeal, oatmeal raisin. nut raisin with nuts. For me, number one is Snickerdoodles for sure. 
Oh, number number two is they're called Mother's Taffy Cookies, and they are amazing with milk. Nutter Butters are three. I'd say, I guess Oreos are four, and then Oatmeal Raisin. Although Oatmeal Raisin and Oreos are like really, really close, tied fourth and fifth. <laughs> I would just say oatmeal raisin. That's all five. That's all five. Oh, wow. You heard wow, it here. That's first. how good they are. This nice. next question. This next question from Doritos hits the feels. Oh uh, wait, who? Uh, I don't know who asked this, um, but I will. I will correct that question right now because now I just want to need to know. It was Doritos that asked the this question. Oh yeah, so th this is from Doritos. Um, where would we be if the original Star Wars, A New Hope, would have bombed in theaters in 1977? Ooh, this is a dark timeline question for fans of my show. Talk about this stuff all the time. Do I have I to think, answer that first? I can, it doesn't matter. This is this is more of an open discussion question because my head can't even fathom what my life would be like if Star Wars wasn't a piece of it. Hey, Trax, you can go. I need to think about this. Uh, yeah, so my, my first original thought is that I think Marvel and DC... And those comics would be bigger than they are because that IP, like all of that buildup would be probably wouldn't have happened. I don't know if Lucas see it. There's a couple questions I would ask, like, did Lucas have the vision? How many movies did they already sign for? Cause maybe the first one flopped, but then the second one, or I guess technically five and six, maybe they would have done better. and there is a possibility that like star Wars still could have, you know, been prevalent in pop culture just because it was so big. But I think the question is mostly if a new hope bombed and we don't now have all of this IP that we do now, I think that other sci-fi shows, maybe star Trek and like Stargate, those would be a little bit bigger. Maybe the aliens would be bigger. And I definitely think that the Marvel universe and maybe even DC would be larger too, because they don't have that competition that they do now with star Wars. Something else Atrax, definitely would have taken the place. Your take on this is so much more filled with hope than mine, because I'm actually thinking about this. What kind of movies were big outside of fandom driven properties and not just star Wars not happening the way it did. But I feel like that would, the ripple effect of that is nobody cares about Batman 1989. No one cares about the teenage mutant Ninja Turtles. We never get mighty Morphin power Rangers in the afternoon Disney never sees a reason to purchase Marvel because their attempts to do Marvel is just that really awful uh, Fantastic Four thing from the 90s with like the terrible thing in the squishy suit. The squishy suit. Yes, I feel... Oh, also, I didn't do my dissertation on Star Wars The Old Republic. I might have had to research... Call of Duty, mm. which instantly makes me a very different person. I never played yeah. Final Fantasy VII. I never got into Devil May Cry, getting triple S's on everything, platinum trophies in the best console of all time. Right, Marcus? The PlayStation 3. Ha! And so for me personally, there's huge differences um, and then for society, Lord of the Rings might not have even been made. Like the best selling movie of all time could just be Ben Hur or Titanic, which is fine 
except their you know avatar isn't there because why bother with that you know special effects ilm doesn't exist we don't have terminator okay yeah. mm -hmm. like star wars is critically important for society existing the way we know it and not just from a silly wednesday show on disney plus and nine movies where most people seem to hate eight of them just kidding we love all the star wars movies except for episode eight ah sorry everyone i couldn't hold it in um so I'm with you. It's okay. I think about my childhood and what Star Wars did. And I think Atrax, you're looking at it more of, I'm more in line with, I think if Star Wars wasn't there, I would have just read more Spider-Man comics and watched more Spider-Man cartoons. You know what I mean? Even though I did, but I think I would have attached myself more to <laughs> superheroes than Jedi. Um, right. But the thing about Star Wars for me, and this is before the prequels, there was just those three movies and that was it. That, and I mean, and then you got the heir to the empire book and stuff, but really truly like that was it. So all you had was imagination. You know, you took all your, the, the paper towel roll and glued it up or taped it with the toilet paper roll. And that was your lightsaber. It wasn't a, it wasn't a sword from Lord of the Rings. It was a lightsaber. Mm -hmm. And it just, for me, it's hard to imagine a world without it. But here's the other thing. Even if it bombed in 1977, it might have blown up now. Look at all those people that love uh, Rocky Horror Mountain or movie whatever. picture show, picture yeah. show, and Evil Dead. And there's all these cult classics that people like adore. So maybe when they came out, it wasn't crazy. But you know, now I'll, I'll give a better example. The Sopranos is bigger now than it was when it came out. And that's due to live streaming, being able to stream the games or the movies or the show. Sorry. Hmm. So, yeah. Wow. That's, that was a really good question. All right. Hard hitting one. We're going back to Doritos. Um, favorite hot dogs. Ballpark, Nathan's, Oscar Mayer, Kirkland. I guess Oscar Mayer, because I don't think about hot dogs enough to know the difference. All right. See, and the only time I eat hot dogs is when I'm out, like, at an event or something, and I'm like, ooh, hot dogs. Or I guess, okay, no, wait, here's here's my answer, because I eat them the most. It would be Costco hot dogs. That's the Kirkland ones. Kirkland? Okay. Yeah. Oh, so I, I am very those. passionate about this. Buck 50. Um, I am very passionate about this. It is a KM natural casing hot dog because it's called a Fenway Frank. And that's for all you fuckers out there who don't know or go to baseball games that isn't in Fenway Park. You guys suck. Go Red Sox. Anyway, sorry. Moving on. Man, that was from hot dogs to baseball real quick. Oh, yeah. Fenway Frank, baby. Fenway Frank. Anyways, last question. Uh, take us away. Favorite Disney movie. This is from Quinn. What is your favorite Disney movie? Oof. And the comment is Emperor's New Groove or Bust. So there's only one right answer according to Quinn. I guess so. Which I'd have to ask, does this now include all of the Disney-owned IPs? Because you could easily say a Star Wars movie as your favorite now. Because it's, I think quote, that's unquote, a cop Disney. out. Yeah, I think that's a cop out. I think so too. Ooh, I have to look up if this is Disney. Mine is Moana. 
Make way, make way. Um, I, I'm kind of torn because it's hard because I watched two. So I have to give two answers because I love Disney movies, but because I've watched these two movies so much because of my kids, I love them. Like I know them, like I know star Wars and it would have to be cars with lightning McQueen and then frozen because of Anna. All right. See, and I also have to give two answers, but it's because when I was a kid, there was a movie that I loved watching and it's still beloved to me now, but since time has gone on, then I don't appreciate it as much because I've seen it so much. So for me, my first answer is the Tigger movie back from 2000. I love that movie and I still do. I still watch it every once in a while. And then um, currently I, I'm going to have to go with Quinn, although I'm not going to say Emperor's New Groove. I'm going to say Kronk's New Groove. I'm going to go with with the uh, Kronk movie because I love Kronk. He's my favorite. You're getting Kronk. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> Gotta love it. What about you, Doc? I said Moana. Oh yeah. my God! It, <laughs> wow! It has. I, I oh, say, were you it paying has, attention, Mark? No, I was. It has I Dwayne Johnson as a voice. The music is by Lin Manuel Miranda, and it is straight up the hero's journey. Everything. Oh, I'm yeah. Doc, tell everybody where they can find you. You can find me at the on the Gaming Persona podcast, which comes out roughly every week. We talk about the psychology of who we become when we play games. You can find me at twitch.tv slash Dr. Gameology, and you can find my writings and everything else I do in some form or another at drgameology.com. Atrax, tell everybody where they can find you. Uh, YouTube, A underscore Atrax. The Guardians of the Galaxy will be coming out this weekend. Twitch.tv slash A underscore Atrax. And if you want a video or something done by Greenbot, email greenbotvideos at gmail.com. And Marcus, where can they find you? They know where to find me. What are you guys talking about in here? Find out next episode of Working, Working Class, Class Nerds. Nerds.